Does anybody know? I just sit up there and I would yeah, explain it. Sometimes things show up for me that don't show up in student view. Uh, when you get a chance, will you check again and let me know if it was just a delay or... I don't think it was up there this morning. It still wasn't up there this morning? Yeah, I don't think so. Well, let me just see what Panopto is doing, sorry. Well, Panopto is still doing this. Does that mean it's recording? I don't, I don't know. It's recording, okay. Um, so, uh, here. let's see if we can fix that. Sorry, Blackboard's just so slow. Um, so while we're waiting on that, I'll go ahead and make some announcements. I will grade and return these graded homeworks on Wednesday, and I'll provide you with the key. At that time, I'll also put up on Blackboard, but I'll bring copies in person as well. So we'll discuss that. And uh, I will also make the new homework assignment that will include some of Chapter 2 at that time. So, um, OK. <laughs> So I, I think the moral of the story is, I think, I, I hope I'll be able to make that Panopto available to you from Friday and that it's just a Blackboard issue and permissions issue. But the other point is, is that like, it's really important to bear in mind that this technology is not robust enough to be relied upon. So I really need you attending. And those of you who are watching the video, if you're not attending I'm, and haven't been attending regularly until now, um, just, just know that I don't. I, I have to report that, so because we get a survey about that. So I don't know if you guys get if that were to happen to you, that you'd be automatically dropped from the course. But I think that's kind of what they do. So just a heads up. Two people mostly watching the video, because anybody here, I would say, is obviously attending. Okay. Um, yes. So let's. We need to start having the first. Lecture that you should see is the one from me. The Panopto video is for follow-up purposes only. It's the intended use. Although now and then you get sick, and that's okay too. That's the that's the secondary use. But really, uh, okay. All right. So let's go ahead then and get going on things for today. So. Um, Today is, again, I just like this class. I'm like, every day I'm like, today is an awesome day. We get to do really cool stuff, because um, it is. It's just like, it's like that every day. Um, but we're going to talk about projectiles, and we're going to include drag correctly and calculate motion today. So uh, let's go ahead and start with that. So chapter two. And I asked you to read all of chapter two for today. I'm only going to get through the projectiles part today. Uh, that will leave the charged particle in the magnetic field for Friday. So read the rest of it for Friday, please. All right. So the topics in chapter two are projectiles and charged particles. Rodney, would you hit that light? Thank you. Is that better? Okay. Okay. So um, the nice thing about these two systems is that we're going to continue to use Cartesian coordinate systems for them. So uh, that will be nice. Um, let's just go ahead and get going. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to find the motion of projectiles, uh, but we are no longer going to neglect air resistance. So we'll have projectiles. Now we are, we are uh, including the effects of air resistance. All right, so a uh, couple of things that you need to know about air resistance. Um, what we are going to do is we are going to allow 
the lowercase f. And in the past, we used lowercase f for friction. Uh, but now we're going to also allow the lowercase f to represent air resistance. Um, and I will use the words air resistance and drag interchangeably. And uh, things to know about the air resistance, one is that the magnitude of the air resistance is proportional to the speed of the object. The faster you go, the more air resistance you encounter. Um, and I guess that's a strong statement. I shouldn't say, let's just let's say that the air resistance goes up when speed goes up. Because sometimes it's a proportionality and sometimes it's a quadratic. Sometimes it's a linear combination. All right. So nonetheless, the magnitude of the air resistance increases as speed increases, and therefore we'll want to express that magnitude of the air resistance. Ultimately, it will be some sort of function of speed. And so that's how we will deal with magnitude of air resistance. Now, for direction of air resistance, uh, the direction of air resistance is that it is always opposing the motion of the object. So if the object is moving this way, that's not supposed to look like a free body diagram, it's supposed to look like an object moving that way, then this object, if I were to th draw a free body diagram, its air resistance would be the opposite way. All right, so it always opposes the motion of the, of the object. It's always in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. Okay, um, this is, there are, there's a little bit of subtlety in this statement because we all know that now and then you have a thing that you can do, like uh, you can make an airfoil shape and in that case, as you pass through a medium like air, uh, you will also get not just a drag force that is directed in the opposite direction of your object. We're going to have this object is moving this way. Uh, you will also have a lift force that comes from the Bernoulli equation on the, uh, the fluid through which you are passing. Um, so. We are neglecting that for this moment. Another time when you can get a force like that would be if you were to, um, maybe if you could imagine looking from above, if you were to throw a curveball, it's very important that a curveball has spin on it. As a result, relative velocity here is greater than it is up there, and you get a Bernoulli effect again that get, puts a sideways, this is supposed to be looking from above now with that baseball, that puts a sideways force on it because as this air, so let's say this thing is moving this way, we've got air moving relative to it that way, relative to the surface of the ball where it's spinning here, this air is moving faster than it is up here, and so as a result we get a Bernoulli effect. Uh, Sideways. Let's put it at that. Sideways. All right. So we're not going to let things spin and we're not going to let them be shaped like airfoils right now. We're not going to call those things necessarily uh, what we're interested in today. So, okay. So what we're going to have today is we're just going to have maybe something spherical without spin that is maybe, you know, released into the air with some initial velocity, be not. And at that moment, I can draw a free body diagram for the object. It would have its weight acting downward. And remember, in a free body diagram, the direction of the force is represented in the arrow. So I usually just label it with magnitudes. Um, and so now that I have the velocity going that way, I will have the uh, drag going, and I don't need that, going right there in my free body diagram. And that's not an F dot, that's just an F. Sorry about that. All right, so that would be the type of situation I'm talking about where you have a free body diagram like that. Okay, so um, we're going to talk, let's talk first about that magnitude of the friction force. Um,
the friction for uh, the, sorry the the drag force it is equal to some magnitude that is some function of speed and it is directed in the negative v hat direction so i'm going to go ahead and put the minus sign out front of the function okay and what you might want to know is, well, okay, that's fine and good, except what is this magnitude? And at low speeds, we will have two dominant effects that will give us two terms. And those terms for magnitude of the drag force will be a constant times the velocity plus a different constant times velocity squared. All right. And, you know, your uh, author chooses to call this first term F sub lin for the linear term and the second term F sub quad for the quadratic term. And they are physically from two different phenomena. This guy here, this linear term, he comes from viscous drag that occurs around the edge of your object. So if you look at your object cutting through the air as a cross section, it is the perimeter of your object along which that friction force is acting. Okay, so this is the viscous drag that occurs along the perimeter of the cross section of the part of the object as it flies. So uh, let me write out those words. Viscous drag. Along the perimeter. of the object and as a result I see that this constant B here should have something to do with the perimeter of the object. The greater the perimeter the greater that effect will be. And so as a result for instance for my spherical object B will be equal to something times the diameter of my object. It will be proportional to diameter of my object because perimeter is proportional to diameter. You guys all right with that? Okay. Now, this quadratic effect comes about from something else. That is the force that you are applying through a distance and as a result compressing the gas in front of you. You being the projectile, sorry. So as you travel through the air, yes, you've got air rubbing along your sides here, and that's sort of like a friction force, but you are also compressing the air in front of you, force through distance. That work that you're doing is turning into thermal energy of the medium in front of you. Okay, do you guys agree with that? That's what happened to the Columbia, like the Columbia disaster, the shuttle, the, the space shuttle Columbia. I mean, it wasn't that it just has this viscous drag that's heating it up, it's the fact that it's heating up this air in front of it and compressing it to very, very high temperatures, glowing temperatures. So you go <coughs> close to the temperature of the sun, and you need to be insulated from that compressed air, or else you will also get to that same temperature, which will probably be above your flash point, and there could be, you know, fire. Okay. So anyway, so that phenomenon where you are actually doing work on the medium in front of you is what this drag term is, all right? So we will say that this is the force that is required to compress the fluid in front of you. Of, uh, of the projectile. Sorry about that. Okay, that says projectile. Okay, so uh, as a result, that factor that must multiply the V squared is not proportional to the diameter, but it's proportional to the area, because you're using that area like a piston to compress that medium in front of you. And so it goes as D squared. And the constant that we'll put out front of the D squared, we'll just call it gamma. And again, if you were to evaluate this full term in terms of that rate of compression and what that force must be, you would also get this V squared out. 
Okay. All right, so that's my sort of hand-waving argument of the two terms that we are going to include for right now. All right. They still are, are, this expression is a good approximation still for, for what we'll call low speeds, meaning we don't want to start thinking about uh, things that involve turbulent flow, of, resulting turbulent flow of the medium at this time. But, okay. Anyway, because uh, then we'd have different terms in there. All right. So, what do we, oh, so what are these values of beta and gamma? Uh, your book gives you one important example, which is for a spherical object moving through air that is at standard temperature and pressure, meaning zero Celsius, uh, one atmosphere. So, So in that case, beta is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4. And we could say that we could get this result from, oh, by the way, I'll give you units, Newton second per meter squared. We could get this result experimentally. We can also derive this result from the density and viscosity of the air, which we're, again, also determined experimentally through very similar experiments, so it's all kind of circular. All right, and uh, gamma uh, for STP air is 0 0.25 Newton second squared per meter to the fourth. And these units are all what they must be, so that when you plug it in here, you have newtons as a result. Oh, and this should be, uh, sorry, meter to the fourth. When you plug it in here, you will get C, so that'll get rid of your meter squared. You'll wind up with newtons second squared per meter squared, and when you multiply it by V squared, you'll wind up with newtons. So those units are just whatever they had to be through unit analysis, such that our drag force was indeed a force with units of newtons. All right. Okay. Now, a lot of times, you're not going to have to include both terms. The vast majority of the time, you won't have to include both, both terms. That's why when you were in your calculus-based introductory physics, you did some problems, sometimes you know, the drag went like V squared, and sometimes it went like V, but you didn't use this linear combination. That's because there's a very small time, uh, region of cases where, that, where you'd have to include both of them. Usually, you only have to include one of them. So, uh, in order to determine what you need to include in that expression for magnitude of the drag force, which you will need to do on your own, given whatever physical situation it is that you're thinking about, you'll have to think about this ratio. Uh, this page is already dirty. The quadratic term of the drag force divided by the linear term of the drag force. Okay. And so... CV squared, just from here, divided by BV, also known as uh, C, which is gamma D squared. Over B, which is beta D, times V squared over V, which is V. You guys okay with that? And just simplifying that, we see that we get gamma over beta d, which is the diameter of your sphere times v times the speed of the sphere. OK, so once you calculate this, uh, if we find that it is much, much greater than 1, then all that you are going to have to include is the quadratic term. You get to include, uh, neglect the uh, linear term. How's that? F quad is just equal to F. 
If you find that this ratio is much, much less than 1, then you get to neglect the quadratic term because it's so much smaller than the linear term, in which case the drag force will just be equal to the linear term. All right? Yes? So what is much, much greater and much, much less than 1? Well, that's the thing. I mean, your effect will be, you know, if you find that, there, that 1 is, say, 10 times the size of the other, then you're neglecting something that's the order of 10%. That's probably not a great time to, to do that. But usually you'll get numbers that are like 100. And so in that case, it's going to affect your third sig fig. But, and so your answers will have to be limited to two sig figs. But then in that case, then you have a good, a good approximation there. It's all about the level of accuracy that you need in your calculation as well. Is there a question over there? Okay. Um, and so, I, again, your, your author does a fine job, so I'll do as, this as briefly as I can. But the ratio for a baseball can be found using the diameter of 7 centimeters. And... Let's imagine that you're going to throw it at a speed or consider it moving at a speed of five meter per second. In that case, the ratio is, I will just plug in gamma point, we're imagining throwing it through the air now. So we got 0.25 divided by beta, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus four. Uh, I guess uh, maybe I should go ahead and I'll just go ahead and note that the ratio of those two things is 1.6 times 10 to the third. That's just gamma over beta that I substitute for. And then I'd have to multiply by my seven centimeters. And these are in MKS units, so I went ahead and left the units out. That only works if everything else is in MKS units. So my diameter has to be in MKS units, which will be 0 0.07 meters. And my velocity has to be in MKS units, which it already is, 5 meter per second. So let's remember MKS units are units that are made out of meters, kilograms, and seconds. All right. And when I do that, I find that I have a value of 560. And what I will do in that case is I will just use the quadratic term because that will be good to within a, you know, a 1 560th or so. Oh, it might be off by on the, on the fourth sig fig, but that's all. Okay. So in this case, I would just use f is equal to f quadratic. We, there are similar examples that are done for the uh, Millikan, uh, an example of a tiny, tiny oil drop, oil drop, like you would use for the Millikan oil drop experiment that you guys will do uh, in senior lab. And um, that, in that case, we found that it would, the number, if you're interested, is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 7 for the ratio, and that's why we use our linear drag for that type of system. Um, and a raindrop of one millimeter moving at 0.6 meter per second, we got a ratio of 0.96. That's one where you have to use both terms, but that's pretty rare. So, okay, usually you can find one term is much greater than the other. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave those others to you if you're interested to, to evaluate them in more detail. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is, because it does connect a little bit, is the Reynolds number. Now this Reynolds number has to do with the medium. So um, we've dealt with this or, uh, in my calculus-based intro course, but if you didn't, that wouldn't be that unusual. Uh, the Reynolds number uh, is equal to the diameter of the object that's traveling through the medium times the velocity of the object times the density of the medium divided by the viscosity of the medium. So that lower, that thing in the denominator there is not an N, it is an eta, and it stands for viscosity because you can't use V for viscosity, too many Vs. All right, so I'll just notice here that eta is viscosity. All right, so another way to look at this is not that the object is moving through the medium, but maybe you want to look at it from the frame of reference where the object is at rest and the medium is rushing by the object. 
That would be sort of the point of view in which the Reynolds number is looking at this. The diameter of the thing that's in the way of the medium. Yeah. Would this hold true for flow and doctor pipe? Absolutely. So moving moving through a um, an opening, it's the exact same expression as moving around an obstacle. Uh, so it could be the diameter of the obstacle or opening times the velocity of the fluid relative to that thing times the density of the fluid divided by the viscosity of the fluid. And what we found, what's, it's kind of interesting, is that this Reynolds number is also approximately equal to this ratio from above. All right. And... The thing about the Reynolds number is that when the Reynolds number is less than 10, then from the point of view of the medium flowing around that object, you have a laminar flow. That means that object is sort of slicing through your medium and leaving it left. The streamlines that came in together, they're leaving together as though the object was, had, had never even passed by. Right? So it, it leaves the medium undisturbed. And from the medium's point of view, it is experiencing a, a laminar flow. Okay, and if you get to Reynolds numbers that are very high, so uh, maybe 10,000 or so, kind of trying to, let's say over 8,000, then what you are having from the point of view of the uh, fluid is that this object, we're flowing around this object, but after we get to the other side of the object, our streamlines start to curl and tangle, and we have a very um, turbulent flow as a result. And we can have some, oh, sorry, we can have some very interesting effects on the drag force as a result of that. And sometimes that's sort of why the golf ball has the dimples in it, right? To try to get the turbulent flow, because if you can get the turbulent flow, um, you can actually go, uh, your drag force actually gets decreased. We're not gonna talk about that exactly, okay? Not right, not yet, not yet. We're going to talk about times when we have linear and quadratic drag forces, and we will just build and build and build. All right, we're gonna start here. Okay. All right, so um, let's do a problem. So the most general problem um, that we're going to work on for right now is the linear air resistance. We're just going to start with the simplest mathematical problem and move on from there. So let's start talking about the projectile is... Uh, moving through the medium and is experiencing linear air resistance. All right. So in that case, what I mean by linear air resistance is that the magnitude of the drag force is just equal to the linear term, to a good approximation. In that case, let's say I have this object here moving through the air like so. This is its velocity vector. All right, now I'm gonna draw the free body diagram for it. So I'm going to have mg directed down, and I am going to have uh, hopefully those two look anti-parallel, BV directed backwards, from, uh, directed opposite the direction of the motion, of the velocity. Okay, so that's my free body diagram. And the next thing I need to do is evaluate Newton's second law. All 
All right, so I'm going to do that using Cartesian coordinates. So this vector equation is going to give me, in this case, I just have a two-dimensional problem, so it's going to give me two uh, scalar equations. The sum of all x components of forces is equal to m times the x component of acceleration. And the sum of all y components of forces is equal to m times the y component of acceleration. All right, so what I have here, I'm going to make a coordinate system. I should always have that in my figure. I'm going to call to the right x and up y. And so I'll just look at my, my forces here. So my only force that has an x component is my drag force. And it has a... Uh, y component of minus b times the x, just the x component of the velocity. And that is equal to m. And normally, we go here and we go x dot dot. And we think about the second derivative of x because we want to solve for x right away. There is a trick to projectile problems, which is we don't go there right away. We notice that this is equal to Vx dot. The reason we do that, I think it's probably obvious, is that our force depends on the variable V, and we'll wind up with a differential equation for just one thing here. That's, it's easier for us to solve it. That's all I've got to say. Hopefully you see it. All right. And then similarly in the y direction, I have minus mg minus bvy is equal to m, the y component of v dot. All right? So these are the two equations that we need to solve to get the general motion for this type of thing. And we will do that. We will do that as soon as we uh, think about, eh, I could just do it now. I guess it wouldn't hurt anything. Yeah, I'll do it. Let's do it the way that your author does. He probably is crazy like a fox. I could just do it, though, if you wanted me to. I'm trying to decide whether I want to do it or not. We'll come back here and we'll plug in the rest in a moment. So take a break, and we're going to move on to a slightly different topic. So later on, we're going to finish this, and I'll come back to that in a moment. First, the reason I'm going to come back to it is this is a two-dimensional problem. Maybe it would be better to start off with a one-dimensional problem. So put a pin in that. Let's think about a one-dimensional case. One-dimensional case of the previous problem and the example that comes to mind is the horizontal motion of a cart. Now a cart is something that's big enough and we're actually going to have it moving slowly but a cart is bigger so generally that will have a linear uh, a more dominant linear term. Um, also things that are moving through a more viscous material because of that um, uh, beta term will have a more linear. So like even if you had something that was moving um, in a way that would be quadratic in the air if you had it happen through molasses that motion would, would probably have a linear type of drag force. Anyway, okay. So we're going to consider that we've got a cart that is moving along and he's rolling along the rails like so, all right? Rolling along. And let's say it started off with some initial velocity and then you just sort of let it roll after that. So initially it's moving with some sort of v naught x. All right. And if I were to draw a free body diagram for this object, it would have its weight down, it would have its normal force up, and it would have a drag force backward. Now, 
This object's not sinking in, not jumping out. You can evaluate Newton's second law in the y direction to find that the normal force is equal to the gravitational force. There is no net y component of force, and that's a trivial portion of the problem. So let's talk about the more interesting part of the problem. So, which is the x component part of the problem. By the way, coordinate system on my drawing. Okay. All right, so in this case, I have minus B, Vx, because this object is only moving in the x direction anyway. Just plugging in. The only thing with an x component is this drag force, and it has a magnitude of BVx. I went ahead and made that substitution here. And that is equal to mass times the x component of velocity of the cards dot time rate of change. All right. So this looks well, it looks promising. So let's go ahead and solve this thing. I got, I'm going to get my variable with the differential all alone on one side the equal sign. So I get minus V over M times the X. All right. This is not one of those where I can integrate both sides because I don't have this. These guys are both functions of time. Just to be clear, they're both functions of time. And as a result, but they're both unknown functions of time. So I can't just integrate one side and, and keep doing that. But what I can do is I can look at it. And I can say, I need a function here whose derivative with respect to time is equal to a negative constant out front times my original function back. And I've got one function that'll do it. Does anybody know what it is? What function's derivative is proportional to itself? E, e to the, that's exactly right. So I need to look at this and say, all right, then I know that this will be an exponential and that my solution here, we Vx of t will be, uh, oh, and by the way, I should do minus v naught t, but that's all right. We'll be, let's go ahead and just do it in, in, in the, books way will be uh, a e to the minus b over m times t plus b. So I've got these two constants that I have to think about because I've got this, this is my functional form of my solution, e to the minus b over m t. That's the only thing that when I take its derivative, I get minus b over m times the same function back. You guys see that? All right. Now, if this object moves forever, uh, then it should come to rest. So here's where I have to start thinking about the uh, physical boundary conditions. So I've got a couple of boundary conditions, and I'll, with, with those boundary conditions, I'll be able to figure out what these constants are. So I've got boundary condition one, which is that Vx, oopsie, Vx, when t is infinity, is zero. It's going to come to rest when t goes to infinity. So it must be, and I can plug in in this equation, that zero is equal to, as t goes to infinity, this will be zero plus b, which tells me that b must be equal to zero. Are you guys okay with that, or are you want me to show that? All right, so then I'll go ahead and evaluate it for t equals infinity. is going to infinity plus b. I know that this value for my boundary condition must be equal to zero, and it is equal to, well, what is this term here? When t goes to infinity, this term here, with the a multiplying it, what is that equal to? What's e to the minus infinity? It's one over e to the infinity, zero. So evaluating that boundary condition determined that 
my constant B must be equal to zero. Now I've got my second boundary condition. And since I'm doing it this way, I'll just write it below here. Boundary condition number two is that my Vx when t is equal to zero must be equal to v naught x. So that was sort of given. So then I plug in. For Vx at t equals zero, I've got v naught x. And that is equal to a times e to the minus b over m times 0 plus b, which is, I've already figured out is 0. So that's all I've got. And e to the 0 is 1. So I wind up with b naught x is equal to a, or a is equal to v naught x. So now I've figured out what my constants must be. I've got that constant done. I've got that constant done. I'm ready to plug them in to my general solution to get my specific solution for this case, which is that my velocity as a function of time is equal to my initial velocity times e to the minus b over m times t, which is fine. One often writes this expression in terms of a time constant. So we write this, we allow m over b to be equal to Clearly, my exponent has to be a pure number. I can't take a number and take it to the power of something with units on it. So if t has the units of seconds, then b over m must have units of 1 over seconds, right? And m over b must have units of seconds. So we allow m over b to be called the time constant tau. In that case, I can write my solution as v naught x e to the minus t over tau. And that's my solution for velocity as a function of time. Now, that's well and good. What is my expression for location as a function of time? Now that I have this expression for velocity as a function of time, I'm ready to do that. All right? So I've got vx t is equal to v naught x e to the minus t over tau. I'm going to take both sides and integrate over dt from time equals 0 to some later time t. All right. And this is going to give me x at t minus x at 0. And I'll tell you what I'm probably going to want to do a lot of the time is define my coordinate system such that when t is equal to 0, x is defined as 0. So x at 0 is going to be called 0. That's a choice of coordinate system for me that I can make. So that's probably what I'm going to do on this one. Um, now, I perform my integral on the left-hand side. I have to perform my integral on the right-hand side. v naught x is a constant. It comes out front. And then I've got e to the minus t over tau, which is an e to the u. And if I had this as du, I could do the integral very easily, e to the u du. So the way to get this as du is to divide by tau. In order to keep my equal sign, I have to multiply by tau out here. And I need a minus sign on that. So I'm going to have to multiply by minus tau out here. Now I've got e to the u du. Are you guys all right with that? OK. So my integral of e to the u du is e to the u. So I get e to the minus t over tau, which I have to evaluate from 0 to t. And I have to multiply that by minus tau for my equality to hold. So my final expression. Not quite there yet, but I'm close. X is a function of time. Is equal to V naught X times negative tau times E to the minus T over tau minus E to the minus zero over tau, also known as one. 
I'm going to multiply through with this minus sign, and I get v naught x tau. I want to get the exact same expression as your author, so everybody's happy, happy. Minus tau v naught x. I don't want the minus sign anymore, do I? No, I don't want the minus sign. Times 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. And you can also remind yourself that tau is equal to m over b, if you want. That was the definition we chose before. And that's your location of this cart as a function of time. Okay. So I am almost out of time. Where does the cart wind up? Where will it be located in the end? It's m over b v naught x, that's right. Because as t goes to infinity, then that's your value. All right? So uh, let's just go ahead and notice that x at infinity is m over b v naught x. And you could also rewrite this expression in terms of that. All right. Um, and I think that's, that's a fine expression as well, just reminding ourselves that that tau is m over b. So next time we will do the y, a problem that relates to the y motion in the y direction. And then we'll take those two solutions together and this will, that will make our motion to, that will allow us to solve for our motion of the projectile. All right, so... I will see you all on Friday. Have a good rest of the day. Now I get to do the work.